Hi, what's up? My name is Matei and you're watching Surviving Art and this time I have a wonderful video I did with the wonderful Michelle Lloyd from United Art Space and we discussed art and storytelling and how your narrative and creating your narrative is extremely important as an artist and I want to share this video with you so thanks again Michelle for inviting me and I hope you all enjoy the video or if you're listening to this on a podcast I hope you enjoy the audio so cheers we live because it's not it's still loading if we're live hello <laughs> we're just setting up with zoom yes i think we're live fantastic hello welcome everybody i hope you're all very very well i am so excited because we are joined with our guest expert who produced an ebook especially for our members which is very very kind uh mate to imagine that's it <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just asked him how to pronounce his name. Um, yes, he's produced the ebook and he's kindly coming in this evening or this morning. Some people are in Australia. We have members from around the world um, to talk about the ebook. And I know lots of people have already read it and have got so much from it. So we thought we'd invite Matei in so we can go a little bit deeper, have a chat about it, and then answer any questions as you go along or maybe at the end. Um, depending if we're in the flow of chatting about stuff. But please feel free to comment as we're talking um, and chip in with your thoughts or comments or anything. So welcome, Mate. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Why don't we start? Because I think there'll be people who haven't come across you before. So let's mm -hmm. have a little chat about mm -hmm. who you are yeah. um, and how you got into art. Tell us a little bit about your story. It's a, it's a bit of a long one. So I, um, I started out as a painter. Uh, I went to the academy. As, uh, it was a decision I made probably around 14 or 13 to go into the arts and just the only thing that I ever saw as a goal in my life was to effectively be an artist and go full time as an artist. So I applied to the academy, got accepted, then I did my master's and so on. But as time kind of passed, I, you know, the, um, I wouldn't really call it existential dread, but it wasn't really a present feeling. Eventually you find out that, well, there's so much more than just making your art. You know, there's uh, all these rules of the art world, all these uh, uh, gatekeepers that you have to impress and so on. And um, eventually, my whole career from an artist went a little bit astray from art and more into the direction of how to, uh, so what art actually is and more into theory. And now it's pretty much just, I wouldn't really call myself an agent. I still do art and I still, well, only if I'm invited, I don't actively pursue exhibitions, but uh, um, effectively what I do now is try to make other people's artistic careers happen on scale and yeah. I try to propel them forward. So that's what I do. I love that because we're both the same actually. And um, because I studied art and was an artist for six years and then ended up the same as you really, coming across so many brick walls and mm. feeling so frustrated and just not understanding it, how, how it all worked. And I took a step back mm. and I just immersed myself in reading books and, and, and asking myself kind of the similar questions, maybe a bit different to yours, but just really trying to understand, like, what is it to be an artist? And yeah. what, is, what, do, what does it take to actually get your art out into the world? And why do some people make a living and some people don't? And, and so that's led me to where I am today. And I'm the same as you now, so passionate about helping other people mm -hmm. figure it out. Cause it's like, mm -hmm. when you look at it, it's quite simple, isn't it? And I love the way you've described it in your ebook. It just makes mm -hmm. so much sense and the power of story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's often overlooked, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the problem is that a lot of the times, I mean, it depends on how you look at art, but a lot of people will look at art as an object and that's pretty much it. They understand that somebody had to make it. And if you talk about people like Jeff Koons and Andy Warhol and all these big names, then obviously the artist is as, if not more present than their work. But for everybody else, like 99% of everybody else, it's just an object of something and uh, effectively art being a subjective thing. Everybody thinks, okay, you can't really make people understand 
your product the same way or your art piece the same way as you would like it to be. Therefore, you can do anything and you know you just put it out in the world and hope for the best. Mm. Whereas the really differentiator that should be done by any artist is really think about their target group and who they are trying to talk to because you can look at it like this. We artists have an issue with the world, with our position with the world. There's some friction, some status quo that is broken or just not working. And we feel it. We don't really maybe feel it in an intellectual level or understand it, but we feel it in a bodily level, like a primal thing, really. And there's a lot of people with the same feeling, but the difference between us and them is we have something, some a skill or maybe just an interest to project that into the outside world that effectively becomes an artistic object mm -hmm. of any sort. Mm -hmm. And if you know what your troubles are with the outside and what really is that just a little bit, just a little fraction of that problem, you can find people who feel the same way towards life mm -hmm. and those people that might not have this skill will appreciate you and your story and especially your story, because the object they then get or buy or just look at, just mm -hmm. experience, will give them the same thing that you give yourself while mm -hmm. trying to make sense of this convoluted thing that we call life. Yeah, um, we're yeah. emotional beings, aren't we? We, yeah. are, we are emotional. Yeah. And I think, yeah, people relate to art in an emotional way. And we teach inside the hub, we've got seven key ingredients and one of the top ingredients is your why, because mm -hmm. inside your why leads to your who, you know, this relationship yeah. like you've just been talking about mm -hmm. um, and the, the reasons why and the, you know, the, the soul behind the work. I've just mm -hmm. got to read us, uh, Stacey says hi, Les, hi Colleen, Stacey. Colleen says hi, <laughs> um, Stacey's saying I was the same, an artist through and through, but everyone told me I wouldn't become anything. I've seen this a lot, Mate, recently. A lot of people commenting saying that, you know, and I, I did a live earlier about it actually, about people, especially in art school and even as a young child learning art, that you won't ever be an artist or, mm -hmm. you know, the small comments like that can really have a massive negative impact yeah. on an artist's yeah. confidence. Yeah. And I've seen so many people actually just give up making art for years and years because they've had yeah. someone just crush their confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just yeah. crazy. Hi, Mandy. Mandy's hopping on. Loads and loads of people joining. Um, so, yes. And I love, I was just reading um, the book before I'd hopped on. I've, I know everyone, most people have read it. If you haven't, it's inside the hub. You can go and read it. It's in the just in section. Um, but we were just talking, Sylvan um, wanted to say that she read it and she said that for her, the, you know, the statement where you talked about art equals the viewer, the art, the artist. She said mm -hmm. she especially really um, loved that. And also the sense of creativity for people who are not creative themselves because she's never thought about her art being for that purpose before. Mm -hmm. I think people get so involved in art being for them mm -hmm. and this ebook is fantastic because it's it's you starting to think about this relationship with the audience yeah. and how you can bridge that gap yeah yeah i mean if you look at it this way uh it's it's all in a way a process where you start with trying to figure out what it is to you what you know, you, you throw a stone as a, as a child, you move your legs and you're fascinated by it. It's just like, there's not a lot you have to do to make yourself fascinated about something. But eventually you find things that fascinate you to a point that make you think about yourself and your relation to other people and whatever. And it does make you go inside yourself as an introspection, which is a lot of the times the beginning of anyone's art career is just finding out who am I? You know, the, the thing you said, the why. And mm -hmm. this part is exclusively for each and every one of us to do for ourselves and not for anybody else. But then there comes the second step where you have to say, or maybe you get to the point where you feel, okay, I've reached a certain understanding. And now I think I feel better about these questions and I want to share that. 
-hmm. And that's really where I think the real, let's say, journey of being an artist begins, where you say, I have a concept of what I think the world is about, and I think uh, through my objects or through whatever I do, I have figured it out to a certain point, be it just emotionally or maybe even intellectually, and I want to share that with other people. And I think that's, that's the point where art really becomes art, whereas mm -hmm. before it was more or less just, you know, meditation or research, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this, this um, sentence that's taken from the ebook about art seems to be everything. And we all know that something is, that is everything, yeah. nothing at all. I just wanted yeah. to talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. because I feel that sometimes artists um, make themselves diverse because their, their, their perception of making it is actually appealing to lots and lots of different people. Mm -hmm. And actually the opposite is true, isn't it? Um, yeah. Because like you're saying, it's, um, you know, if you're trying to speak to everyone, you speak to nobody. Yeah. Um, and I see this happening so many times where I think people have so many different things going on mm -hmm. and they're actually trying to speak to too many people. Um, it gets it's lost. Hard. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. And it's hard for artists sometimes, isn't it, to, to narrow that down because... You know, as creatives, we kind of feel this today and then feel that tomorrow and then want to do this. And it's, it's yeah. difficult, isn't it? But it is yeah. the key. It really is the key. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, it, it takes practice, actually, to get rigorous enough to start focusing one's energy. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's like children running around. They just get exhausted and that's it. And over time, you learn to focus on one thing and then you can actually read a book and so on. And uh, the same goes for us artists. I mean, you're we're all curious by nature. That's who we are. It's, it's why we're interested in the minuscule things that we're interested in and nobody else even cares about them. Or even, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people will say, well, it's interesting what you do, but why? You know, I feel no need to discuss. I have no idea what some minuscule part like let's say philosophy of mind 99 percent of people will not care about philosophy of mind i don't care how my perception works i think if i see it that's effectively there you know this cup is here because i see it and that's done for me I'm, I'm fine with this conversation and this thought process up till now whereas artists will say okay but why you know maybe they'll look at the material and so on it, it, it goes a lot deeper and to, as you said, focus this attention is imperative if you want to go deep enough to actually understand what you're doing. Because mm -hmm. if you effectively are an artist that wishes to really take this as a career, you have to find a certain niche that you belong to, as I said before, like the people that kind of feel the same way as you do, and then really, really understand what they're all about because effectively, you know, you understand what you're about. Mm -hmm. And then you can talk to them and they can listen and they can understand. Because you make, you try to make people who would not care by themselves about a certain thing, care about that thing. Because you know the right words to say or the right materials or that's what I talk about in the book, the materials and presentation, all of these factors, yeah. the context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Les has just hopped on that's what happens to me to keep focus on my art although I am passionate about it um, do you mean Les that you kind of keep changing direction yeah I think that's what he means mm -hmm. he's passionate about lots and lots of different things yeah mm -hmm. it happens to a lot it happens to us all <laughs> <laughs> it does I mean I myself I have to have three Two to three, I think it's more free projects at one certain time. Yeah. I found that, you know, you try to do one thing, everybody tells you, do one thing at a time. And it just doesn't work. It doesn't work for me. And I have to do three things at a time because I get bored after four hours and then I switch. I do four hours of that thing, effectively uh -huh. making 12. And I can work with precision and with my attention focuses on a point, but not the not in one particular field it just doesn't work so i think you have to find you know 
what works for you. Some people that are really precise that like, you know, the meditative work where you take a long time to do something, they will enjoy eight hours of whatever they do and they won't know they did eight hours of ICAP, too frantic, ADD or whatever you want to call it. I don't think that thing is this, but you know. You get yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> It's the best way to try and describe it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been diagnosed mm -hmm. with that, but I still don't know if I've got it or not. But it's my brain is erratic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I love that you found some, you know, a way of coping with that or having different projects. I think the thing to remember as well is this is not forever, is it? When you're finding that consistency, it's a moment in time. It's honouring where you're at right now mm -hmm. and knowing that you can do other things in the future. It's yeah. not saying that that's it forever now, that you, this is it. It's yeah. about really finding what lights that fire right now, where, you know, yeah. what is it you want to communicate. And, and it's, it is about getting really deep, isn't it? And self-reflective on, on what Absolutely. your purpose is and your bigger purpose mm -hmm. and how this will impact other people. And I love that, you know, today there are no gatekeepers anymore. Like you said earlier, you can literally, and I, this is why I'm so passionate about doing what I do because you, everyone's in a position where they can carve out their place in the art world. And it doesn't even need to be in the traditional sense of the art mm -hmm. world. It can mm -hmm. be finding, like you said, a pocket of people that have the yeah. same interests as you. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, they might not even be um, collectors of art, but suddenly you inspire them with mm -hmm. your own interests and then mm -hmm. they become a buyer of art because you've yeah. inspired them to so um yeah it's a really a really exciting time to be in yeah 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 it's a uh, it's a really great book by seth golden do you know him yeah the I'm marketing just guy yeah this, this is marketing yeah um uh the 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 the, the tribes tribes book his older one I haven't read that one. I've just, it's on okay. my desk over there. This is uh -huh. marketing. That's the one that I've just finished reading. That one's absolutely great. I've been waiting for that book for a long time. And it is, I think, one of his best. Um, he did an older book was Tribes. It was called, I think the title was Tribes, where he talks exactly about this, what we're discussing right now. That yeah. The internet and this whole hyper-connected world is allowing us to really get to the 10, 20 people that we actually need the smallest niche possible. And uh, as you said, they don't need to be collectors because you can make collectors out of them. Mm -hmm. And this is what's happening right now. It, surely it takes more time, obviously. But then again, it is something that is in your own hands, your control, and that can come from you without any anything in between, any filters that would otherwise think TV or any other like archaic or just old messaging system or communications device, you have to pay people. Even they have to pay to print magazines that, you know, spread the news about different things like a new car and so on. They, these things cost, now it's free. Mm. Just the idea that marketing is free. It's just amazing. It changed so much just in a short mm. space of time. And like even, I don't know how many years ago, 10, 10 years ago, maybe even less than that, you know, to reach the people that we reach today, you'd have had to have gone on primetime television, yeah. advertising, hundreds yeah. of thousands of pounds. Yes. Yes. And like I say, yes. you can reach people now. Yeah. I loved part in the ebook where you, you give people advice, um, the what, what you can do section. And one thing that I think people overlook is the... Um, is the presentation, which you mentioned a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. So choosing your materials carefully, mm -hmm. um, but also um, the presentation of your work and, and putting the work into context as well. Because yeah. I yeah. feel as artists, um, you know, the bit we like is the making. I, this was me completely. I hated the presentation bit. So I used to just love, love making. And I always used to get the feedback from my professors that you need to really think about the way you're presenting this. Um, and I just used to think, I just hate that bit. And I hated hanging it and all of that. But it is really, really, really important. And I think that, um, especially in today's world, if you're doing a lot of online marketing, mm -hmm. to really show the work in context, mm -hmm. um, to inspire people, but also to be really blatantly obvious like this is meant to be on a wall or this is yeah. meant to be on a product or i'm you know like to give people that information yeah 
it's yeah. so important yeah. isn't it but i think just from a presentation point of view also it really really is massive and i loved that in your ebook that description about you know when we look at a piece of work and you put it in a church or you put it somewhere else it has a completely different meaning mm -hmm. yeah and so yeah. it's it's important yeah. I, but i think as artists the job of making kind of ends there sometimes doesn't it and and there's a lot of potential lost from this bit that you've talked about in the ebook yeah. Yeah. about showing yeah. it in its context mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is it's actually not at all connected with art but i like the uh, analogy the uh, there's a triad of things that every business needs to have which is effectively the entrepreneur the uh, manager and the technician and we artists are effectively more or less the technicians of our own business. We like doing it. We like being in the now, you know, this meditative in the now idea and how a lot of artists connect their work with spirituality, not necessarily the religion, but just spirituality. Mm -hmm. And this does make us tend to just focus on the work itself, but there is no projection. There is no uh, thinking about how will it be presented, as you said, or who will look at it, is it important who our audience is, and so on, and obviously the monetary part where you don't really care about taxes and so on, which is one, you know, it to just kind of happen, an inventory just kind of happen, nobody wants to count paintings and, you know, just do, just <laughs> somebody else to do that and the most important one of them is presentation and um it is something that was very overlooked in my where i went to school as well it was uh, the academy is modernist so they only care about the product the material uh, and they go on and on and on and nobody really cares about presentation mm -hmm. and what this does i think is also not just not make us care who our audiences how we show it but it also makes us not appreciate um how can i tell this um the the public side of art not you know the the, the side that it's not connected to you it's not just you who will be experiencing it and it's just not only for you mm. and you have to really think about for who for whom the artwork is i love that because i think this is where many artists get stuck because we're so involved in the making it's all about us when we're making it usually yeah. isn't yeah. It? we want to know some people make it for other people um and then so it's it's like you go down that rabbit hole and then you come up to the surface and you just have no clue who it's for mm. and so the more though that you start to question that and i think a lot of people in our group now are starting to do that it, when you want to sell or even if you don't want to sell, if you just want your art to get out there and, and, yeah. and you know, it has a message behind it and you change the social situation or whatever, it always then becomes about the, pe the people. Mm -hmm. It's no longer about you yeah. in the sense of why you yeah. made it and all that connection. Yeah. But yeah, the more you can start thinking about it, then it starts to get really exciting then because as we've been saying in today's world, when you start to really think about who it's for, you can actually reach the people. Mm -hmm. so instead of putting it anywhere, yeah. you're raising yeah. your chances yeah. of it actually yeah. getting in front of the right people. Yeah. I love this conversation. Yeah. I just get so yeah. excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a um, Maureen says, sorry, you're late. No problem. Hi, Maureen. Um, I'm just reading the um, messages on here. Can I can see them on the screen. Uh, Colin okay. says, I used to be like that, but I have recently found a subject that keeps me focused because of the various colours and textures. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I think it's a case, isn't it, Matteo? Just playing. You, you've got to allow that time, I think, to play and to figure out what it's all about and what you're good at and what yeah. you like to fire. And then yeah. it's about putting a kind of deadline on it, I think, because you can spend a lot of time in that play mm -hmm. time and mm -hmm. without putting a deadline on it and thinking, yeah. right, now I need to start thinking about who this is for, especially if you want to make a living from it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It makes you accountable. It makes yeah. you accountable, not just deadline wise, but actually if you can imagine the kind of person that will like your art you can try to i mean it's an act of projection but you can project them you you are accountable if you can make something that 
something, some, somebody like that would enjoy, it would enrich their life. I mean, it's a little bit also your responsibility to share mm. that and to think about that because uh, the point is, if you make an object and you hide it away, it's not art. No. I don't care how it looks, it's not art because art needs the spectator to effectively make the experience. Yeah. Art is an experience, it's not an object. And yeah. if not if the, the wrong people see it, it's just an object. Yeah. It's not art. The whole problem with you know people discussing, ooh, and this is art and this is not art, and a lot of philosophy has been well, wasted on just this topic where it's blatantly obvious that it's not important to fix one kind of you know this is art and if it's a little bit different the object is then not art no but nobody wants to look at it as an experience mm. oh. i watched a program on tv and i think it's on a t television program in the uk it's mm -hmm. kind of one of these programs where the celebrities <laughs> come in and they they paint and um and there's a, a panel um, of people judging their work basically and it was just really really interesting because of what you what you just said reminded me um so this one judge um critiqued this work as terrible and it was a um life painting life drawing <clears throat> and um you know she said it was awful and then some of his other works she just said they they weren't classed as fine art and it's a huge totally labeling things and and has obviously got her own perception and her own opinions yeah and i just thought though it's so damaging though sometimes to other people but we have to accept that that everyone's got their own opinions yeah yeah and we've got to kind of allow ourselves to protect ourselves so that we're not damaged by those and, yes. and so fear comes yes. in yes. and continue on but the interesting thing was the work that I just mentioned that she criticized, the guy who he'd painted looked at all the works at the end and chose that one as his favorite. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. It is so, so, so subjective. Yeah. And that's why yes. you've just got to stay true to who you are and be authentic yeah. and stay, yes. stay true. Yes, yes. Um, yes. Oh, lots of people are saying this is so, so helpful. Very, very true, Mate. So agree. Brilliant discussion, Mate, Michelle. Uh, wow, that's help, a helpful way of looking at it. Finding ways to get my art seen is something I find hard. Um, yes. So let me, let me scroll. I also really, really loved the talk about um, when you're starting to think about where to put your work. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about the public institutions and private galleries. Yeah. But, but, so thinking about the re what their motivation is. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, again, sometimes people are just putting their work in random places and don't ever think about that. So I thought that was a really, really good point yeah. to pull out of the book, is, is that keeping in mind um, what the objective is, because you made a good point about public galleries. Um, have a different motivation completely, so they're not focused on selling and making a profit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a really good point about looking into that before you choose the places to put your work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not sure how it is in different places. Like Slovenia is a really particular example where I'd say 90 to 95% of the art market is publicly funded. Effectively, only 5% of the art that is produced here is actually bought by a physical person. Everything else is government money. And uh, it depends from, obviously, from country to country. And bigger countries will have more evolved art markets. And therefore, obviously, it all depends also how rich the country is. Mm -hmm. And if the government itself is actually doing anything about art, well, art is sooner or later becomes the, the part of society that is underfunded because it's not essential really and um it's what i wanted to say is about uh, private galleries uh is interesting because you know the two kinds of systems you have is like private galleries and this whole classical idea of approaching it whereas on the other side you have this new idea that i think we also touched upon a little bit like the web presentation just going directly using social media and so on maybe even 
Satyar or so, such sites, though I can really say I really approve of them because their business models are sometimes really shady. And Satyar won't even tell you who bought your work, which is, mm. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it takes away the whole part of actually having some, uh, somebody tell you, I think your art is good or not. I liked it. This is why I think we connect. So on this human connection is just taken away and it's just about money so mm -hmm. web platforms are a question for themselves but the point is I'm trying to make if anyone really wishes to decide to go the route of a, a traditional gallery the traditional gallery gallery system it is something that is a decision that has to be made and then stuck to because it takes a very long time and this decision usually looks like I myself, because this was my decision um, until a few years ago, I was part of the system and so on. I had two full, not full time, let's say two jobs, effectively eight hours a day that I worked that were not connected to art in any way to support this decision because it takes a lot of time to get into the network of galleries, uh, to the network of these people that control the galleries, the gatekeepers. It is a very wonderful system that still works. Cutthroat, really hard to get in though, but um, it only pays up, pays off, let's say 10, 15 years effectively, unless you're really lucky and maybe your connection base is really great. But then again, you know, it's a different conversation and a different kind of people uh, so i think if anyone would want to propagate the, their art and their message into the world and in the shorter run have more out of it i would really recommend taking a look taking a closer look at the direct model at the online presence because it's it's going to grow exponentially over time. Mm. And even though it's heavily overpopulated as it is right now with Instagram and Facebook not really giving any more organic reach and so on, it's just, you know, you have to pay to play now, mm. pretty much. It's still a better chance of getting seen, a better chance of getting to a point where you can maybe even say, I live 50% off of my art, which is, uh, more than many other artists effectively can do is with this kind of model in my opinion so mm -hmm. yeah i agree and, mm -hmm. and I, it all relates back to the title of your ebook that stories everything yeah. because even facebook and instagram are encouraging more authentic conversations they want engagement they want people to be conversing and it's just mm -hmm. not about just posting a picture of your art and expecting people to like it it's about conversation mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and so the more that people and artists can dig into this story and I love this I think in the ebook somewhere um, you know you talk about that everyone has a story uh, yeah. and, and everyone has a unique story and I always say this everyone is individual you've all got your own unique experiences yeah. but I think a lot of the time people think that they are not interesting and that no one wants to hear what I've got to say um, and the art will speak for itself um, and, and I think sometimes it's fine and you said this as well and I agree that it's okay to let the art speak for itself sometimes mm -hmm. but in today's world to really like you say we're in an overpopulated mm -hmm. um, mass marketing mm -hmm. world aren't we at the moment yeah it's got so much potential but it is really really noisy and so the more that you can stand out by reaching out to the people and having this relationship and this commonality between people helps you stand out yeah. in the noisy mm -hmm. world. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's all through story. It really is yes. story. It's so, so yes. powerful. Yes, yes. Uh, for example, I was just interviewing a friend of mine today for a project I'm doing. And as you said, people don't think their story is important or interesting or anything out of the ordinary. But, um, for example, he does resin art. He pours the resin, it's just like some, uh, it looks a bit pollocky, but more flowy. I, I don't have the words to describe yeah. it. That's the point, the, the art would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, he's actually quite successful and really successful if you look at what the art market is doing in Slovenia. He sells overseas, mostly America and UK and so on. But the point of his story is, 
that this is a man that does a full-time job that provides for his family for two children and one wife the wife his wife is obviously also going to ha has a job and so on so it's not just him as a sole provider but they live in a house um he works eight hours a day from morning till four o'clock then he takes his children out does their thing birthday party so on and comes home at eight or nine o'clock he does household and maybe cooks and so on and after nine o'clock where his wife goes to bed and his children go to bed he goes to his atelier and paints until three o'clock in the morning, wakes up at seven and repeats. And if that's not a fascinating story, I don't know what is. And you can see it in his eyes. You can, when you talk to him, you can see it, that he loves it. He's tired, but he loves it. And, yeah. you know, you, you don't have to be born in Somalia and then, you know, magically happen to be one of the best artists in the world. You have this trajectory to, to say that's a great story. No, it's, it's a Hollywood story. It's expected somebody has this maybe happen, but all of us have a personal story. Mm -hmm. And it's much more interesting for me to tell that kind of story than, you know, uh, just some, something that people can really relate to. Yeah, it, it's the way the world's going, isn't it? People want to buy from people. Yeah. And there's this whole, especially online, I think there's this trust element that people want to feel they can trust you and yeah. understand you. They want to buy from people that are on the same wavelength. And yeah. um, it just, and it's just a great way to, I think like you were saying, when you're thinking about going the, the gallery route or raising your profile on social mm -hmm. media, um, there's so much more excitement from building up your own audience and building up your own fan base. and um your collectors and getting to know them and yeah yeah it, i think it's more of a journey then because i think people that go down the gallery route and there's no right or wrong by the way it really yeah. depends i think on the people the artist and whatever yeah. floats your boat <laughs> yeah. um yeah. but when you go down the gallery route you're kind of governed then by the gallery and they will they will um you know review your work and keep it in line and give you feedback um They'll and mold then, you. They'll mold you into something that's palatable yeah. for them. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you are giving away part of yourself. Yes. Whereas when you go the other route of finding your own fans, you're sticking to your why. And so you're, you're really um, creating work that's still really, really authentic. But then you're starting to listen to the people who like what you do. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to manipulate your work and tweak it. So it's still in line with yourself. But serves people it could be just simple things like the scale or like you were saying in your ebook you know the way you present your work you might find when you start to get to know your customers that they want massive scale or yeah. Yeah. they want yeah. they yeah. want big fancy i know this guy actually who now what's his name i'm really bad with names um owen garrett mm -hmm. who is the pencil neck on his website but mm -hmm. he was in, and he's a pencil drawer. He draws mm -hmm. really um, realistic drawing mm -hmm. of um, all the oil industry. And so what he did is he grew his fan base. Um, it's very, very, very niche. Mm -hmm. um, and he's got an association because his, his father worked in that industry. But what he did is he manipulated his work and changed the presentation of it to fit that. Because what he was finding was people in the oil industry were buying his work as gifts for their employees. So what he then does, what it's evolved into now is this huge mass um, production of original drawings, but beautifully framed, presented with the person's name. So he's kind of adapted that. And yeah. now they are selling for thousands because the oil industry is huge. Yeah. And he is known now um, across his, um, I think, well, probably internationally across, mm -hmm. if you want an oil, you know, a, a painting of uh, a certain area in this oil related area, you go to him. <laughs> yeah. And that just yeah. shows the yeah. power of when he started out, it would have been small. He would have just probably had like a few people who noticed him from that industry, then they go and tell someone else. And it's like the momentum builds. So he didn't yeah. just do that overnight. Yeah. I think it's yeah. easy for us to look and think, oh, you know, that he got lucky, but it would have just been the whole things that we're talking about now is niching down, identifying yeah. a collective 
group of people who have a common interest and then it grows and grows and grows and grows. Yes, yes, yes. Because if you find people that are really interested in what you do, really, really interested, not just vaguely interested or find it amusing or whatever, it's like, it's, you know, deeply interested, they will care about it enough to tell other people who are also deeply interested about it. And it's not just connecting us with the people who might be interested in our work. It's also connecting the people who are interested with our work with other people who are interested in what they're interested. So effectively it's a, you know, the network spreads far longer and far wider than just two D people that we would like to target. It goes, as you said, it grows exponentially. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what I think also is great about having this opportunity to talk directly to your customers or just fans or so on, you all are experiencing the world in some, let's say, a similar fashion with similar ideas and similar issues and so on. And when you talk to people like that, you effectively kind of talk to yourself as well, but in a more, let's say, unforgiving way because if you you can talk to yourself in such a way that you say okay i i won't do what i have to do or you know there's this constant conversation with yourself and just allowing yourself too much leeway or not enough leeway so on where people other people might not be so forgiving and though they have the same ideals they might tell you okay i think your work is great but i think you know something's missing here and if you know that this person understands your work he, his advice, his ideas are worth so much more than anybody else that could tell you. No professor, no, nobody can tell you such a profound piece of advice as somebody who actually really enjoys your work because yeah. he's fixing his own issue that he sees in your work. And yeah. he knows that issue much better than maybe even you do. Yeah, I love that. I, I just, oh yeah, you struck a, struck a chord with me there because um, I was doing a live about this earlier and I wish I'd dropped that in there <laughs> because just that thing about taking advice from people and it's okay um for people to have opinions and to give you yeah. advice yeah. but um if they don't understand what your objective is you know it can be very very dangerous to take advice from people if they just don't have a clue what what your aims are yeah. um yeah and i was kind of trying to say that earlier but you said it much better <laughs> just that <laughs> Oh. Need to make a note of that one. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is. It, it, it's but, quite volatile taking advice from people who have no idea what you're about because they're giving advice to themselves. Mm -hmm. My advice, what I think is good, is what I think is good, not what I think is good for anybody else. I think you should do this because I would do the same, but mm -hmm. I'm not in your shoes, you know? Exactly. No idea. And I think it can be interesting to see other people's perspectives and it can challenge yeah. us sometimes to get out when yes. we're in our comfort zone and yes. it can be, someone might not understand you, but say something you think, mm, okay, I might give it a go. Yeah. But um, you hit the nail on the head where, you know, when you are surrounding yourself with people that do understand what you do, they're in a much better position to, uh, to feed what it, the direction that you go in and, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just going to read some of the comments. Um, mm -hmm. Les said, so the way to go would be to exhibit at online exhibitions. Mm -hmm. How about creating an online exhibition to help other artists? Um, well, it, again, it all depends, I guess, on your motivations, doesn't it? Um, if you want to teach. I think, okay, now you're back. Sorry, I, I lost you for a second. Did it go off then? Okay. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's Did fine. you hear me read out Leslie's question then? Well, yes, I heard the question, but I didn't hear what you said after reading. Uh, okay, it. yeah. So, so I think, I think Leslie's feeling a bit lost and, and doesn't know which direction mm -hmm. to go in. Um, and so he's asking about creating online exhibitions to help other artists. Um, it is an interesting concept to have an online exhibition, but you lose all the material traits of any work you know if you look at anything that was made bigger than a screen on a screen there's no way you will experience the work as you should and take for example a Rothko or any big abstract expressionist work you have to be there because it is a physical experience first and a mental experience second mm. it's like you know if you imagine you're inside a forest 
and you don't know really where you are, but you're not really scared, but it's just a foreign place. It's a bit dark and you hear the sound. It's like some sound. You have no idea what that sound is. And then you start to imagine what that sound could be. It could be a tiger, it could be whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you see a bird making that sound, then it's fine. It's okay. You know, you get the connection. But yeah. what I want to say is the first thing is always an emotional factor that triggers the intellectual factor, regardless if you know what you've uh, heard, if you know what you experienced or not. And if you show work only via screens, that's why I have an issue with screens. You take the emotional factor out and you leave just the intellectual factor that has no idea where to go. You know, you have no feeling, you have no emotion to guide your thoughts and you're much quicker to maybe arrive to a decision like, I don't like that. That's weird. I don't get it. But standing in front of it, it's like a Rothko, for example. A lot of people say, I really don't get the blotchy painting. It's just a blotchy paint. How can it be 60, 70 million if it's just a piece of blotchy paint? He even used an assistant. It's not even his work, blah, 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 so on. But if you stand in front of it, and if you really take your time, sit down and really look at the damn thing, after five minutes, 10 minutes, it'll start to move. The colors move because they're made to move because it's, he played perception itself. It's like op art, you know, it, it starts to swiggle around. And the mind, because it has to, it's programmed that way, will try to make sense out of it, but it can't because it's an, it's, you know, it's an optical illusion. The mind can handle it. That's why it is an optical illusion. It's just a break point. And you don't get that from a screen because it's just not enough humans are you know made to experience things in small little squares with pixels in them um, I, yeah I, yeah i totally agree with what you're saying and i also think you have to work a lot harder online there is there is lots of potential but i also see artists just post their work with no descriptions um and again, you're losing that connection because it's a busy, busy world. We scroll, scroll, scroll. But even sometimes I see work and I've been working in the arts now for decades. And sometimes I still see art and I just haven't got a clue what it's about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I haven't got time to go and ask, but I'm intrigued. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so there's this thing missing, isn't there, sometimes with this, we feel that we're giving too much information. But I think it serves a purpose, definitely, to invite people into the work because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just seeing it online you're missing something aren't you yeah 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 i wouldn't bash it though i mean obviously oh, online oh, showing of works is it's yeah, just different yes. you've got a yes. different yes. Yes. way yes yes of it's a, making that emo emotional connection yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's always a question i guess of energy spent and you know roi return of investment how much energy are you spending on making that online show mm -hmm. versus are you really going to get a lot out of it Whereas maybe if it takes, I don't know, two, three days to organize this, make the web page, program the code, or use WordPress, or however you do it, um, or just get three of your friends or artists you know that kind of do similar work and have an open atelier and invite everybody for a beer. Mm -hmm. And it might happen that somebody invites somebody, you know, effectively you get to somebody who might like the work and even decide to buy it or just have a conversation that leads to something in the end like a cold contact even mm. whereas you know online is there's nothing happening with me as the viewer and the screen there's no hand reaching out to get my attention it's just hey if you want to look at this and i check in i look at it it's nothing happening i was like oh cool he did the show and then i log off and that's it and i the artist got nothing. I didn't really get anything, but a lot of work was put into making, you know, this online exhibition. Mm. And maybe VR and so on might change that, but that's like ten years. So mm. uh, I uh, I would focus on physical more and use online primarily as just getting the word out there. It's like this is the kind of work I do. If you are interested in just the visual what you see in this small square on Instagram or wherever, come to my atelier, come to me and I, I can show you just let's catch up some, some form of connection that can happen as, uh, as, a, as a fact of that. Mm. Uh, I'm just going to jump to the comments. Um, mm -hmm. 
So yeah, Leslie's saying, yeah, that totally makes sense. I didn't think about it that way. Brilliant, that answers his question. Um, Colleen, so then it is a good idea on these social media sites to find your thread and only post that work to keep the viewer interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to have that consistency. So it's again, thinking about the people, I guess, isn't it? So if you're starting to gain a following, Actually, we've got a great quote out of your ebook here, which relates to this. Um, so you don't buy a new Stephen King novel because you're expecting a romantic comedy and yeah. you don't read a J.K. Rowling book because, um, sorry, you don't read J.K. Rowling because of her knowledge of biochemistry. Yeah, yeah. Each yeah. creator has their own body of work distinct from everybody else. And thus people learn to expect a certain kind of art from any one of them. And this is really important. Um, yeah. And that's kind of like answering that question, Colleen, um, about people coming to you because they expect yeah. something. Yeah, especially at the beginning. That's, yeah. I, I don't view it as something, you know, you decide, now, as you said, now I decided you owe me this and this is true for the rest of my life. No, obviously not. But yeah. you have to be consistent for at least a minimum amount of time, be it one year, two years, or three years, and make people know what you expect from you mm. uh, because you're challenged by uh, everybody else who might do similar work and sometimes it's just the story that differentiates you know your work from somebody else's but the work itself looks the same yeah so consistency yeah sorry you oh no i think i broke you off or you wanted to say something sorry no, no, sorry. I was just reading mm -hmm. the comments coming uh -huh. through. Okay. Uh, I'm just laughing at one of the comments because um, <laughs> Maureen said, invite everyone for a beer. I'd be broke if all my friends turned up. <laughs> bring your own booze. Yeah, bring your own booze then, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, Kristen's saying that's such good advice to show it in real life. Art always looks better in real life. Yeah, and that's where video is great as well, isn't it? I think, again, mm -hmm. that context thing because it's often yeah. quite difficult to see how big things are and yeah um so actually videoing things is, is a good yeah. no interaction yeah. between people to get a true feeling about the work yeah um brilliant one other thing as well um that i wanted to talk about before we move on where's it gone now because i've just lost my place <laughs> oh yes this was it so it was thinking about by the way um, guys, if you've got comments or questions, please fire away because we're going to be wrapping up soon. Um, so please fire any questions whilst we've got Mate here. Um, just fire away and uh, we'll answer them before we head off. But before we go, I want to talk about comparing work because you talk about this in the ebook, and I think this is a really good point as well, mm -hmm. where I think sometimes we can get sucked into maybe following artists on Instagram and, and then following other people. And then we just think, oh my gosh, the whole world is full of this kind of art and there's no point me doing this anymore. Yeah. I think yeah. I've fallen into that trap myself. Um, and, and so you, you make a great point of don't, you know, don't get into that habit of comparing your art to other creators and, and instead focus on your own message and your own personal story. Because even though there are lots and lots of people probably doing similar things to you they'll never be the same will they because like you say we're all individual yeah. and it's yeah. what you have said in the whole ebook is what makes the art different is the story behind it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i just thought that was a really good point yeah to absolutely bring into again um yeah. because when you start thinking about it from the the audience point of view they're not in that art world while they're following all those artists so they don't yeah. even know yeah. you know sometimes we can get lost and think yeah everyone's yeah. seeing what i'm yeah. seeing but yeah. they're not yeah. Yeah. no no. <laughs> the, no the people that you might carve out in your own world yeah. don't even know that all this yeah. other art exists because yeah. they're living in a completely different world does that make sense yeah. <laughs> yes it does yes it does i mean if you just look at anything that isn't picasso people might not know who that is any yeah. artist who isn't Picasso, nobody will probably know who that is. Yeah. Just this fact, forget Koons, Hirst, Ai Weiwei, uh, Murakami, all these famous artists, people don't know. Mm. And then you don't even get to the conversation of talking about some maybe less, less known, like boys, mm. very famous artists, but less known in the public eye. Absolutely. 
I, I think comparing yourself to other people serves a function when you are trying to figure out what you are, who you are, and so on. Because effectively, if you see somebody using a tool that you'd like to you know, learn, and you look at them, that's how we learn. We observe and we replicate, and then we know how to use a certain tool. And art in itself is built out of small mental tools that we learn how to use a brush and how to think about what I did with the brush and so on. And it's a myriad of things, you know, that happens. And if you observe people who've already come to a place where their style is already evolved to a point where it's like Hearst, you know what to expect from such an artist, even as unpredictable as Hearst, but you kind of know what to expect. Uh, you can learn how they use the tools, how they think about the world and incorporate small pieces of their mindset into your own if it helps you, you know, to make sense out of it. Mm. But not after that part, you know, when you try to talk about your work or when you present it, obviously it needs to come from you. Mm. And there's a big issue when you, you know, you get to a point where you say, okay, I used things that other people do, but now it's all just about me. Am I now cheating? Is this stealing or is this borrowing or so on? But if you think about it, nothing really is new in the world. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful book. I forgot the guy's name, but uh, Monomyth. It's, uh, do you know the book? Um, no, I don't know that one. It's, um, I can check actually because it's a computer. I can go on Google. Uh, it's... Um, Hero's Journey by, uh, b -b 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 what's your name? Um, it's a very, mm, sorry, I won't find it. The, the, the title of the book's Hero's Journey, so not to go on too long. Yeah. I'll find it and put okay. it into the group afterwards. Okay, okay. The point of this book is that most of these stories that we know, be it Red Riding Hood or Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, doesn't matter, all follow a certain let's say, a certain mesh, a certain guide of how they progress. You have the hero, then the problem, you know, this, the um, dramaturgical triangle. This word I can't really translate. Do you know what I mean? Don't ask me to pronounce that. <laughs> okay, no, 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 it's a, it's, a, it's a different English word and it is in Slovenia. It's a theatrical triangle. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Yes. How yes. is that called? Yeah. It, the thing, the triangle yeah, thing. The triangle. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so it all follows a certain kind of rule how it evolves. And all of life in itself follows these kind of rules and all the stories we tell and all the work effectively that we do, regardless if you're a painter, sculptor, if you're abstract expressionist or realist, we all question the same things. What is life? What is death? Who am I? And so on. Mm. And if you think about, you know, stealing from other people or borrowing, I think is effectively a stupid thing because it's just trying to make sense out of an issue that is immortal, that is going to be here when we go away, when the other gener generations after us come, it's still going to be the same thing. People are still going to ask the same questions. So all we do is ask the same questions and try to figure them out as we are individual people, give our take, give our, you know, our energy into it and our process into it. And then as a community trying to figure it out. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't look at it as, as stealing when comparing or using, uh, using other people's works, but as building yourself via yourself, build the community, if you know what I mean. I mean, yeah. be straight a little bit from the topic, but... I, no, it's good. It's all good. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm just going to read um, some of the questions that are coming through. So Stacey um, said, I used to follow loads and loads of art groups and look at other art and think I just can't compare. And it made me feel deflated. But recently I've only followed five or six artists who I admire and studied them and connect with them. And now I have found my own way of creating my own style in a similar context. I've never been so happy. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I think that's a really good point actually of just yeah. limiting the amount of people that you follow I've started doing that more from the point of view of just feeling overwhelmed because mm -hmm. if you're following so many people it I just, know what you mean. It just mm -hmm. fills your head with too much stuff doesn't it so yes. I think it's a really yes. good tip Stacey is to just yeah. use yeah. a few artists at a time 
yeah. surround yeah. yourself with those artists and then yeah. you kind of you can eliminate all the noise and the opinions yeah. and everyone else, what everyone else yeah. is doing yeah. and yeah. that helps with what you've been saying doesn't it Matteo with focus yeah. absolutely and absolutely just keeping yeah. on your path yes 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 and especially if it the the idea of comparing yourself to other artists is, is a tool of trying to get a feel if you're good enough or not which is very toxic in itself it can be because there will always be people that are maybe better than you and worse than you and so on but that should not matter because i mean it's, it's a cliche it's a platitude but in the end, we should just try to be better than ourselves the day before, just trying mm -hmm. to be better than our prior selves. But uh, it's quite hard when you get, you know, when you follow 500 other artists, prof preferably somebody who's signed by Gagosian and then somebody else who's in another big name gallery and you're just looking at them and all 26 and all balling in giant yachts and you're like, Jesus, you know, <laughs> my life does not amount to anything, but <laughs> it's it's comparing yourself to 0.0001% of people who yeah. might just got lucky yeah. somewhere. Yeah, you know? I agree, I agree. Uh, Maureen said, hi, <laughs> I'd like to ask, is it okay for artists to take on jobs or commissions which don't exactly fit in with their work or style and maybe not what they want to do? I've accepted a job recently which pays quite well and quite high which is, and then the comments disappeared. And I'm, I'm assuming, Maureen, it's not what you really want to do, but it's paying a lot of money. It's a great question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think this is one that artists face. It's that yeah. Yeah. selling the soul, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. It is. A, um... It's a tough one, isn't it? Because I think if it's like a one off commission mm -hmm. and it's a one off job, um, and it's not taking you away from your right, why too much yeah. of the purpose. Yeah. yeah. It's a tough one. What do you think, Matteo? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, I had a few of these where I was in the same, I'd say in the same shoes where I tried to. Um, a few days ago, I finished a project that I didn't really want to do that had nothing to do with me but it was just a monetary exchange and i could do it and it was also for lgbtq community that i just felt passionate about trying to help them propagate their message uh, they had a 10-year anniversary and i made the catalog for them it has nothing to do with i do or with my art but i just happened to know the tools and i said sure i'll help you and it was just a help and then a monetary exchange but my point is I use that to get back a little bit to my uh, work in InDesign and I have a clear idea what I will be getting out of it as well because to just do things unless it's really paying a lot and you can you know say okay if I do this one job I'll have two months of runway to do whatever mm -hmm. I want yeah obviously it's a good exchange so I think it all should be depending on what you want Mm. And is it going to help you achieve your end goal, your why, as you say? Yeah. Because this why effectively has to lead you unless it, I mean, if it doesn't, you end up astray and you, you can end up not having a part-time job. Mm. It turns into a day job. It turns into, you're yeah. the manager now, you as well stay and then you're 60 and, you know, and it's it happens great, really fast. It's a great point. I've seen this happen actually with lots of artists where they start to take work that they don't like. Yeah. And it's, I, I've got this quote and I can't remember who, it's not one of mine, it's someone else's quote, but where focus goes and no, yeah, where focus goes, energy flows. Yes. And so yes. the more we put our energy into something yeah. that will then grow. So if you do an amazing job at that, they'll go and find you someone else and go, Oh, go to Maureen. And then yeah. you have another offer of something that you don't want yeah. to do. Um, yeah. So it's just being careful of that, isn't it? That it doesn't grow yeah. Yeah. into a direction that you just don't want to go in. Yes. Um, and it, mm -hmm. it becomes this line, fine line though, of mm -hmm. needing money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if it, like Mate, I think yeah. that was a great point yeah. of taking it on. If it's going to buy yeah. you like two extra days or a week yeah. or something where you yeah. can carry on working on your why, then it's worth it. Yes, yes, um, yes. yes. And 
it's not really obviously it's not a bad thing usually it's the question is about money like can i make some extra cash to you know do my art and so on i uh, i think people should take any opportunity they can take but as you said be careful about but not as a you know it's this, this warning like oh don't you know fear the part-time job because if you do one you'll be hooked for life it's just <laughs> It's, you can always say no, yeah. Yes, yes. But I, I had, I think it was Mary asked me in the group actually, um, because she said that she, because as artists, um, we get asked to do all sorts of crazy things because we're an artist. They think that we can do the memorial and the um, portrait and um, and so and Mary's um, a landscape painter and she was asked to do a memorial actually and she ended up saying yes. And she said, but I just don't want to do it. And I was like, well, I'd say no. Yeah. And, and she yeah. said, because actually her daughter is a makeup artist, but if she was asked to go and do makeup for kids at a local school, she'd yeah. go, no, because that's not the kind of makeup artist that I am. And I said, it's exactly the same thing, isn't it? It's yes. not the kind of artist that I am. And it's okay yes. to say that. Yes. Sometimes we think that we have to say yes, because we're an artist. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You've said that in the ebook, haven't you? That, yeah. you know, Sometimes you feel this need to prove that we are an artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are kind of people pleasers, as yeah. a, as a, yeah, as just as people. Like we we like to give people value. We like to help them. And this can turn into just saying yes to everything because you just really just sincerely want to help people and you appreciate they seeing some value in you. Yeah. But what? none of us should ever forget is the value that we have for anybody is the value that we ourselves create and present to them. Mm. It's not, they won't, they will effectively see the value that we created and say, yes, I know you're a good painter, mm -hmm. but we have to first be a good painter to let people see that. And if you take random jobs, you will be a random job taking person. Mm. But if you tell them, yes, I'll do it, but under such conditions, or if you clearly know what you are doing, and if they clearly know what you are doing, uh, because people won't just you know, take the job off away if you tell them, yes, but this isn't really what I do usually, so you have to understand it, but for this time I'll make an exception, and I, because I don't know, I obviously don't say you need the money, but you, know, <laughs> you, you find an obvious, uh, some some reason why you do it and you tell them because they need to know you are not somebody who does this for a living you're not somebody who is interested in doing that for a living but if maybe another opportunity comes by and you think this is something that could help you fund your process or whatever it is you need to you know set up the agreement in such a way that both parties know what they are doing and what they are getting from you and could get in the future it's a really, really great question because um, I'm just remembering a conversation that I had with an artist a couple of weeks ago as well. I think it was Cindy and she was saying how she'd done the same thing. She'd taken a job on and she really didn't want to do it, but she felt bad saying no to work because she hasn't got any commissions coming in at the moment. So she said, yeah, yeah. yeah. it was making her really unhappy. Yeah. That I really am struggling. It's not my strength. Yeah. And then she was just thinking, I'm just not enjoying this and I'm not enjoying yeah. making art anymore. And and that's that's when it becomes a sad place then it's definitely a no then so yeah, all those things to bring up. it's not yeah. an easy one to answer but uh, maureen's yeah. just said yes i need the money to buy my pals beer <laughs> 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 um she's saying as the job is a one-off am i okay with it i think knowing me um we'll try and make it my own and put my own stamp on it anyway yeah and that that is absolutely what you should do yeah definitely yeah yeah Stacey saying, I think I can earn more money from my true art. I just have to believe in myself. Yes. I'm just going to go back because I think there was a mm -hmm. comment from Stacey. Mm -hmm. Belief is one of the biggest things, I think. Yeah. So she said, um, I used to follow... Oh, no, no, I've done that one. No, sorry. I have to screenshot the comments because... Facebook gets rid of them after, like, it only shows me four comments at a time. Um, she really says, mm -hmm. yeah, I know. I have been trying to get out of the pet portrait business for two years, but it pays more than my current art situation. But this is something I'm trying to remedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that transition, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah, that's tough because people transition. expect that you are a great pet portraitist. That's mm -hmm. who you are right now. 
And a lot of times it happens as something that just happened by itself or, you know, where you don't really actively let people know what you want them to perceive you as. And um, it is a tough transition, but it is something that can happen. And I think does, I mean, um, you go at it in a steady way and you don't obviously cancel every commission because then you have nothing, but you try to tell people slowly after this commission, I think I'm done. I don't, I liked what I did before, but now I think I different thing. I'm in a different place and so on. And you tell everybody so that they understand it's not, yeah, I don't want to paint your pet anymore because obviously it's not, it's not that their pet is wrong. It's not that their portrait work is wrong. It's just not for her anymore. Maybe right now, and maybe at some play, uh, some point of time, it was something that was interesting or even it's just served as a, you know, it's just some, the first validator of your work is good. But the context was wrong. The context was obviously pet paintings. But it's a nice transition to say, uh, I would love to hear from her what, what she wants to do now. Is it transitioning to people? Is it still portraits, you know? Because you can also use what you do right now and what people know you for right now and say, this is my portfolio and maybe have a few works of the things that you would like to do right now. And if you manage to you know, cut the ties with the previous uh, collectors or just buyers in the right way, you can actually use that network to propagate what you do right now. Because obviously the portraits that she did probably were great and people were happy. And if you tell them, I'm in a different place right now, maybe do you feel like something that I do or I want to do right now would be useful for you? Do you think would you maybe consider having such a commission done yourself? Or maybe do you know anybody who you'd like to recommend my work to? Because you know I do great work. And this would make me even more happy. So, you know, it's a, it's a human thing that I think she, she can leverage her decision to go from some place to some other place yeah. very well with her, her current customer base. Yeah. And mm. also, even if it isn't, I've seen, um, there's an artist, Drew Brophy, and his wife has been in as, as a guest mm. expert, and he, he did this. He is a very famous surf artist mm. Mm -hmm. and spent oh, like 20, 30 years as a surf artist. And then later in life, I think it, recently in the last five years, decided, you know, as a person, his interests and everything have changed. And although he still loves surf, it just was not, I think he continued it because it was doing so well and it was really commercial. But then realized that he was changing direction completely to sacred geometry. And it's a completely different customer. Yeah. But done exactly what we've just been talking about, that transition. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's, it's slowly taking place, but he's now growing a new, um, a new customer base who are interested in that sacred geometry and it can be done um, and yeah. more fulfilling, isn't it? When you follow your heart and you start to do it. So it's, yeah. Absolutely. A really great question. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That was a really great question. Mandy says, yes. we never stop learning and absorbing the world, but you're right. Finding your own true art soul is the quest we constantly search for. Yeah. And I don't think we ever have a definite end. It, yeah. it just, that's, the yeah. artist isn't it just yeah. evolves and evolves and evolves yeah 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 uh, it, is, uh, oh, it's gone. it is all flu oh sorry i lost you no yeah uh, you're back you're it back. just went funny then yeah mm -hmm. aha okay um We're back. um what i wanted to say is i'm not really a spiritual person but um jesus no i lost the straight i lost it i lost it i'm sorry the I lost it. Uh, we were talking about, can you just help me? The question was, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, the whole thing, it just broke me off. Um, what That's was the right. question? So, no, we were talking, um, yeah, about, that was Mandy's comment was saying about how we um, were always searching. Yes, and yes, never, sorry, never, yeah. There's never an end. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is all fluid in the end. That's what I wanted to say. I, I yeah. myself am not a spiritual person. I, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm an atheist because I'm not. I don't like the idea of saying there is nothing. So on. It's a very 
empty life, I think, but to each his own, right? But what I want to say is, regardless of how you look at what we are or how you feel about the world, we are a fluid thing that constantly evolves. And the only thing that is a constant in life is that we're problem solvers. Mm -hmm. Everything we look at is some form of function, some form of what can this do? What is, what, what is it all about? It's never a question of what is that? Even if you think you're asking, you know, is, if you're interacting with something new, you might be asking yourself, Ooh, what is that? But it's not really what is that, that that you're asking. It's what does it do? Especially mm -hmm. what does it do for me? Mm -hmm. And this search is never ending. And what something does for me might be good for me right now. But in 10 years, I might not need that kind of tool, be it a mental tool like a, a, you know, like a thought process or an ideology or belief. But right now it might serve me. And this will always change, as you say. And uh, I think the best way to look at it is just to hone this skill of observing things as problems, as functions, as things that do other things. Because if we focus on the process of fixing or mending or changing things, it not only never becomes dull, but it is very fulfilling and it is a very, I think, a very fulfilling view to have on life because things will change and so on. And the products we do will change. The art we do will change. Everything actually does change. And it is much easier to understand this process if you just look at yourself as something that solves problems all the time. Yeah, I think that's where some artists confuse the advice on consistency yeah. with um it just being the same and i think that's where a lot of artists resist when i've talked spoke to artists before about this consistency they're like no i don't want to be consistent i don't and, and it's like they don't want to be put into that um and it isn't about that it's having i always talk about this thread it's putting the thread that ties it all together so it still talks to the same kind of people um but like you say it's always evolving because it would be so boring if you just kept churning out the same stuff yeah. And people will get bored and we, yeah, fluid, all of that. Yeah, yeah. Stacey's put, um, we'll wrap up in a minute because I'm conscious of the time. Um, my true heart lies in bright colours and phobism, not photorealistic work. I've done that for others, but too long. I've started doing my new true style on animals, but it's in the early stages. I will get there. I recently did my first ever painting where I actually fell in love with it myself. Yay! And that's never happened before. And now that's all I want to do. Yay! That's a nice one to end on. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 There's no better feeling, is there, when you just start to tap in with that true passion that's inside, when you're not influenced by other people's opinions and you're just doing something that is so pure. Yes. When yes. you have the courage to do that, because it's, it's it's being brave isn't it when you really just pour your true self out onto a canvas yes yes it is yes it is especially because sometimes maybe even especially at the beginning sometimes things that you don't want to pop up pop up mm. and it does take courage because you know it's obviously it's this grand idea of putting your heart out of the canvas and you find beauty in it and you find that thing that you really connect with and sometimes, like my example, my paintings are always black, dark, gray, green, dark green. And I was never able to paint anything. I would start off with primary colors, blue, red, and yellow, very shiny, and then you just mix up into grayness. And it wasn't really at that time. I just was going through some emotional turmoil and so on that I wasn't really conscious of it, but it happened unconsciously and it just spewed over on canvas mm -hmm. and it does take courage to then stop and observe and not you know just say okay i i like the work or whatever but really think about what is it that i like about this work and why mm -hmm. and uh uh to build on that and it's fantastic though yes yes i'm um one last one last comment and then we'll start to wrap up i think we are all evolving in our journey understanding the need of a thread 
brilliant and all it's fluid and organic fantastic so i think people are starting to understand now this need yeah such passion thank you so much everyone um colleen's just saying walk into a church that create nature and show them your work as drag queens because colleen's doing a um a series on drag queens and we were talking about the context yeah. thing you know if yeah. you into yeah. a church they've just got yeah <laughs> they will stand up I love that. I love that. I'm a big fan of drag, a really big fan of it. So. Yeah, you should look at Colleen's work. In fact, I'll send you the link afterwards because it is amazing. Thank you. I'd like that. I'd really like that. So, right, let's, before we wrap up and say goodbye, um, tell everyone how they can follow you. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's some things inside the ebook with links, but yeah. just remind everybody now where they So, can. best way is to go on www.survivingart.com. It's also surviving out on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter. And uh, primarily, I do a podcast and blog. Occasionally, I also do videos. Might be more now, but the blog and the podcast is on a daily basis. So if you're interested about pretty much topics about the art world, especially about business and pricing and getting galleries and directly going to customers and so on, uh, it's... I welcome you to check them out. So survivingart.com. Brilliant. I just want to say on behalf of all the members and myself, thank you so much for producing the ebook for us because it was so, so lovely to read. Very different to how I describe things. So I think that was really helpful for everyone. Um, and just thank you for joining us this evening as well and chatting about art. We love just sat on the chat. It's amazing. So thank you very My much. My pleasure. My pleasure. It was wonderful to be part of this. So thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. Thank you for everyone who joined us and we'll see you all soon. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.